we all work on projects. We all work with teams. For the most part, we're business analysts. And we work to communicate. We work to explain what our customer needs to our development team so that we can build the right solution. The problem is that our profession has spent a lot of time trying to make sure it gets built right. Has spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we've documented every specification. I have personally written a 200 page document and then had to explain to the person who promised he'd read it why it answers all of the questions he just asked me. As a profession, we're suffering because we write something that even our mothers don't want to read. <laughs> There's a solution for that. My name is Jeffrey Davidson, and I am here to talk to you about behavior-driven development, a means to work and communicate with more understanding so that we can be building the right products together with our teams. On tonight's agenda, we're going to talk about thinking like an investor. Uh, if you want to get really fancy, this term is called feature injection. It's one of the newer Agile techniques. Not that any of them are very old, since it's not been around that long. Then we're going to talk about communicating with stories. And we're going to close with bridging understanding. Really having understanding between different people. Software is an investment. Nothing else. It's an investment of time, of effort, of money. There's only three reasons, it's been argued, for making software. One is to make money. The second is to save money. And the third is to protect money. It's an investment. So what are we doing as, as we work with this, for this investment? If software is an investment, where does the value come from? The value comes from the output of the software. The value to Amazon on the home page is not that they have pretty graphics. The value to Amazon.com is that you order something online, and you pay for it, and they make a profit. So we want to, as we're working on thinking like an investor, determine how do we find that value. We want to do that. After we find where the value statement is, where we find what's important, then we want to figure out which features build that value for us. We want to inject only those features that get us there. And we want to inject those features that will get us there quickest, in fact, the fastest, and provide the most value. Feature injection. Then we want to build examples that make this come alive. Because as much as we talk about these goals, as much as we talk about these high food things, examples will bring those goals to life. So what matters? Actually, I'm going to ask you, what matters? It depends. It depends. Requirements. What's that? Requirements. Requirements. No, I'm going to say what matters is value. If we're adding value, then I don't care if there's a BA on the project. And I've already told you, I love being a business analyst. <laughs> it's all about value. And if you want to add value, you don't want to do what I actually sit in meetings all day long doing. You don't want to argue about features. Arguing about features doesn't get you to adding value. Asking about why gets you to value. So why might someone want to build software? I don't, Robin, we just met today. Why would your company build or buy software? To increase value. To increase value. But give an example of how you might increase value. Well, it's enhancing 
enhancing the or the user experience. Enhancing the user so experience. enhancing the user experience, well, that's good. But are you hoping to convert that user experience into something else? Because user experience itself, I don't know if there's a big difference between a stick and a baseball bat. It's, it's a piece of wood. I mean, we want to do these things for retention of the customer. Retention. So we want to do something for retention. You, good user experience might lead to retention, and retention is going to lead to increased business, and that's going to add to more value. We might do something because our competitors doing. It. You know, because I'm going to lose customers if I don't do that. You could, it could not necessarily have a monetary value. You could be doing it to protect patients. You know. Or like medical software. Yes, yeah. you could be doing it to protect something. Um, compliance. Compliance. Risk is a big deal. You want to avoid <laughs> risk. So you may be building software to avoid some risk so that you don't end up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Because I have to tell you, if you've ever talked to an executive, a C-level executive, their biggest fear is the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Because the easiest way to make the front page of the Wall Street Journal is because you've done something horribly wrong somewhere in the organization. And that's the press that you're hoping you can survive. Not capitalize on, survive. So you want to protect your value for those things. This guy is incredibly smart. He's invented some software stuff. His name is uh, Rick Hick Rich Hickey. Uh, if you go online, you can find some interesting stuff. I'm going to read this slide. I only have a couple of slides where I read it. But this is interesting. We can only hope to make reliable those things that we understand. We can only consider a few things at a time. Intertwined things must be considered together. And complexity undermines understanding. If you tell me anybody can be a BA, I'm going to probably laugh in your face. We grapple with some really difficult concepts here. We work with hard stuff. We try to make the difficult, easy to do. And it's difficult because we can't even keep everything in our minds. It's one of the benefits to many agile methodologies that you don't have to worry about the big picture today. I have to worry about what's in front of me to solve this problem now. Now, that needs to fit into a bigger solution, but I don't have to keep everything in my head. It's an advantage. It allows us to move faster, to be more effective. Can you hear the fire? Yes. I want all of you to put your hands up. Warm yourself on the fire. Now, imagine this is a time before there was a written language. Where's your hands? It's cold outside. You have hands. Imagine there's in this time, you live in a tribe. You know these people. You trust these people. You were born in this tribe. You probably die in this tribe. They don't surprise you anymore. You understand and live with these people every day. There's a chance to drive down to San Antonio. You get to walk wherever you're going, and you walk as a tribe for protection and survival. So imagine on this day, when you're sitting in front of the fire, it's been a great day. The tribe has killed some bison. And you've feasted. And your stomach is full. And the children have started to quiet down. And you sit around the fire. And you wait. Expectant. You're quiet, but your heart starts racing because you know what happens next. If this was a radio show, no one would turn off the radio. Okay. <laughs> what happens next is the elder would tell us a story. The elder would help cement the day. The elder would tell us about how Ugg chased down that bison and tripped over the branch and went rolling like a stone down a hill. And we'd all be laughing. And the story would talk about our history and our accomplishment and our future. The stories have power. 
those stories are things that we as a species have been doing since before we could write. Since before there were cars, since before we knew how to ride horses or camels or any other animal. Stories, oral history, is how we as a race have communicated. It's incredibly important that we do this, that we communicate. Do I mean user stories? As a tribal elder, I want to tell you why this food is good so that you don't kick me out of the tribe. That's not a story, that's a statement. When the tribal elder tells a story, he doesn't say 3.8 miles. Ugg fall. Bison slow. Food good. Bed now. <laughs> what kind of story is that? It's a terrible story. Stories have a context. Stories have some transition, have a narrative, have an order. Stories have a conclusion. So I'm going to argue that user stories are not actually stories, they're statements. They don't give all the preconditions, they don't give all the actions, they don't do a whole bunch of things. What those stories do when you use a user story in an Agile methodology is there a promise of a future conversation. A coworker of mine, Richard, pointed me to Ron Jeffries, who wrote about how user stories and what's on cards are just there to serve as a reminder to the team about the story they already understand. So those are good as a reminder of a conversation, as a reminder of a goal, as a reminder of a context. But they are not in themselves what we need for understanding. They're a reminder of an understanding we already had As a, I want, so that. Another thing that's important here, when you do use these stories, user stories, is we put the so that, the value statement, at the end. As a, I want, so that. The value is at the end. And I have to tell you, as a business analyst, after I've written 10 or 20 or 50 stories, my so that's are really weak. I'm kind of hunting for what the blank I'm supposed to be putting inside that statement. And my team doesn't care because they know it's weak and they can't think of anything better. The problem is that it shouldn't go there. A much better user statement says that put my value first in order to have better user retention as a book product manager at Amazon.com, I want a better user experience. That statement makes much more sense. The value is important. Language is important. And just like these stories that we've been telling since we could barely talk are important, the language we use makes a difference. There's a reason we call some people great orders, and some people, when they start telling a story at your workplace, like, oh wow, look at the time. I gotta go. Because you don't know where the value statement's going to be. This value statement is incredibly important. So let's put it up front. Let's explain what we're looking for, and then build from there. This also makes it much easier because many times when you're writing user stories and you have some technical task, you're like, um, um, as a, I don't know what, I want to stop spam from you. I mean, you're, you're working on all these funny things, you're not sure where it goes, but put the, where's the value first? Because if you put the value first, the rest will flow. So we have two steps here. One, two, one, two. 
Very simple. Start with the business goals. And in agile development, this is a user statement, a user story. And from there, we want to build scenarios. This is that story that our elder told us. That story that gives us understanding. That story that helps us move from not understanding how we're going to get somewhere to the end. So what is BDD? This is another slide I'm going to read in its entirety for you. Now, before I start, that's Dan North. He invented behavior-driven development, or BDD as I just call it. And he has said, BDD is a second generation, outside in, pull based, multi-stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology. It describes a cycle of interactions with well-defined outputs, resulting in delivery of working, tested software that matters. If this is the first time you've heard that line and you understand it, I will give you a lot of money. <laughs> because I've read it, I've studied it, I've ripped it apart, and wow, it was really confusing to me. So really, what is BDD? What is behavior-driven development? Because that, that's right. And if you pull it apart long enough and think hard enough, you can get partway to Dan's big brain, that understanding. But it takes a while to get there. So what is it? It's fine-grained. Focus, but it's a behavior. It's the behavior and behavior-driven development. We want to understand small, concrete actions, and we want that to drive our development. Behavior drives development. And it's told in a story format. Now, the story format's very simple. The story format works whether or not you are eight years old, telling about something that happened at school, or you are a great-grandmother telling about your childhood, or you are a business analyst telling about what you need to build. You start with a given. This is your context. Then you say what? Some event occurs. Then you have an outcome. This all makes sense, but I prefer this other structure because it's bigger and I like it. Given, this is you and your condition. Where are you? Where are you in the application? Or if you're telling a story, where are you in the kindergarten room when something happens? Um, but you and your condition, this is the start. This is the setting. This is the environment that we're going to build our story off of. Just like the tribal elders started with our history. This is where you set your context. When? This is something a specific individual does. Ugh, tripped, tripped over the branch and rolled down the hill like a rock. Ugh, tripped, then he rolled. There's an outcome there. That's what you see. We all saw Ugh roll. We all enjoyed it. We were very glad he was safe. <coughs> really had a good laugh. Given, when, then. So it's important in this, as we're talking about these stories, to have um, it be generic. I put up a picture of generic things. I want it white label. And the reason for that is that I want to not include my design. I want to not include the architecture. Because I need to write from a person who's acting. And when I'm acting in a behavior-driven development story, I'm taking this and I'm saying that given I am on Amazon.com and looking at the books, when I select a book, I see the page. Given when, then I see the page. When I, same given, when I say buy now, then I see confirmation. Okay, when I say buy now, 
then I see confirmation. Did I just tell you which credit card to charge? Anyone? Did I just tell you how many times they confirmed my identity or that they tracked my IP or that they know something else? No. These stories, these bits of behavior that we're writing are specifically about what I see as this user. Now, if I write this from someone else's perspective, maybe I write this as someone watching a back-end transaction in the server room, I might see something else. But when I write for the user, when I write for that, that buyer, all I know is what I see. And I don't know that it just went through you know, 13 different exchanges to verify anything. All I know is that I saw a confirmation. So I don't want to include those design statements in there. Um, another coworker of mine, Paul, he's got a big brain. He said, imagine you're performing the same actions on a telephone interface. So don't say I click the radio button. Don't say I you know, select this on the screen you know, and be very specific. But imagine that tomorrow something happens, the internet decides to go away. China's taking over the internet. I don't know. And as a result, nothing against the Chinese, I've made that up on the point. The, as a result of that, though, we're going to use a telephone interface. And maybe I'm in the book section because I pushed seven, and now it's reading me the 10 best sellers. When I like the one I like, I push six because I really like that John Grisham novel. And then it says, do you want to buy now or hear a description? And buy now is one, so I push the one button, and then it gives me a confirmation. That's a very generic behavior. I should be able to write my stories so that they are very generic. And when, first, let's give a round of applause for the first person who asked the question. I won't clap for anyone else, just so you don't have to. You're talking about a story for all business. Um, well, I'm actually talking, this, this story, this scenario, should fit into that previous user story. So, um, let's, I'm going to skip forward a slide and give an example, and we'll see what it is. So, um, so I want to withdraw money from my ATM. So I'm going to have a user story that done. As a car, ATM cardholder, I want to withdraw money so I can go on a date with my mom. You're a very good son. Okay, so the first scenario, the first story, so that's a statement, a user story. And then what we're talking about here, these scenarios for behavior-driven development, are the really specific things we're going to be checking for. So in this scenario, we're given the account balance is 100, and the card is valid, and there's enough money. When the account holder requests $20, then the account holder receives $20, and the account balance is decreased to 80, and the card is returned. Those are, this isn't a great BDD story as I just described it, but the point here is that this is a requirement. This can be interpreted as the system shall. When we're talking about requirements, when we're talking about what's gone on, when I complain about us as a profession and no one reads what we write, um, People haven't been reading it because it was the system shall, you know, debit the account by the amount of the withdrawal. And the system shall confirm that the card is valid. And the system shall, you know, perform this equation because if it's after 4 p.m. on a Tuesday and the bank's closed, we're not sure if the $100 is still valid because of some other ATM down the block. Uh, no one reads those system shall statements. Um, they're too complicated. So. We said, let's get rid of those, and in user stories, we're going to call them acceptance criteria. Those acceptance criteria in a an agile though can mean anything. I've seen acceptance criteria that said, in the table, cardholder dot valid dot Texas, insert item one two three four in field. You know, street number. That's way too specific. So you've got some requirements 
that are incredibly specific, and some requirements that are make it fast <laughs> or make it pretty. They're very vague. They're all over the place. And not only do I see one business analyst writing these acceptance criteria that are all over the board, my all over the board's actually here. And Roger, his all the board's over here. And Gina's all over the board is over here. We're not even consistent among how we're describing these acceptance criteria. So what this language gives me is a way that we can be consistent. Roger and Jeffrey and Gina can now write acceptance criteria or requirements. We don't call them that in Agile because if I were to tell you I wrote the system shell and took out the first three words, the developers would hate me. But until you, unless you're going to do this, that's about the best you can hope for. Um, that this is a way that we have consistently, a consistent way to describe the behavior of the system in a way that makes sense. Now we skipped ahead, so I'm going to go back. Oh, question. Uh, so on your on your previous slide, you talked about generic. Generic yes. with respect to what? Generic in the respect to actions. That's where I was talking about the telephone interface. So I don't generic. In, in I don't want to talk about generic. design items. I don't want to talk about um, data elements. I actually don't want to talk in anything technical. Okay. My goal here is to only use the business language. Okay. My goal here should be is that if my customer is Julie, that I speak in a language that Julie understands. And she may not know the difference between a radio button, a selection button, and a drop down box or an entry field. Quite frankly, it's an atrocity that we've been training business users for the last 20 years how to speak our language because we couldn't figure out their language. And that's what we've been doing. So let's go back to what does the business need in business terms and do that. So I'm going to go back just to the end. Um, amplify with examples. There's a time for examples in this. Uh, first, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. There is a time for examples in behavior-driven development. I said it should be very generic. Um, so maybe I said, um, given when then, uh, given I have, um, I own stocks, when I check the stock symbol, then I see my account balance. And there's going to be some other presumption that I'm already in the right system, and then you know, I have rights to see that. But given I have the stocks, when I enter my symbol, IBM, then I um, see the today's stock price and the value of my portfolio. Um, examples make this come to life. So your actual acceptance criteria should be given when then. Given I check stock, hold on just a second. But you should have an example that says IBM and a number that says today's value. And I can have a number of those things that say Apple and 427 or whatever today's value is, and Walmart with its value, so that the developers and the testers can see exactly what I mean by what do I enter, because Walmart is not W-A-L-M-A-R-T, it's not a stock symbol, that's a name, so it's W-L-M-T, um, and I should get today's value, or I should get my portfolio value, which is number of stocks times today's value. So examples make this come to life. But in the, with the story itself, we should be generic and be using examples to amplify and make sense. There's a question back here. Uh, is there a danger there being ambiguous if we do it generic? And my second point is, what is the purpose for being generic? Because you can reuse, or is it for easier communication with amplify with an example? So, the two questions were, is there a danger because it's ambiguous, it's not clear enough, and what's the reason for being generic? Those are great questions. I should have slides on those answers. Um, the, you should be generic in part because you should be speaking the business language. You should be generic because it's how we communicate as we're telling our stories and we communicate. And um, the reason is in part for reuse so that we can then reuse this later. The idea that it's a telephone interface tomorrow versus online today versus maybe I also have stores and online. And maybe I even have a catalog. If I write these 
correctly, I could write one set of acceptance criteria but still in my books, and then I could have examples that might be specific for the different interfaces. So should we focus on the selection of language and action driven? Yes, the selection is all about action. This, is, this whole story should be about action. We're setting a context, and the win is all about an action. Um, I'm on something, and I do something. If I'm not doing something, then there should be no response. You know, if I just look at the page, <coughs> it shouldn't just put things in my cart because I looked at it. <laughs> and it certainly shouldn't ship and bill me. Mm -hmm. Another benefit to being generic is you then untie your informational architect's hands. If you why? write very specifically. Okay, why is it important to untie an information architect's hands? <laughs> so we can design a good solution for your issue. Okay. There are also the issues with the architecture of the system. There are times when you say, I'm going to be using radio buttons, and a radio button, for those who know, implies you're only allowed to choose one of the options. Um, so that implication, which you've never spelled out, but you've implied with radio button, means that, oh, a developer may say, they're only ever going to choose one thing here. It's radio buttons. So they architect the system such that it, you can only ever choose one. And two months from now, you can choose two options. And now we have a problem. And it also impedes the creativity. Mm -hmm. We don't allow our architects and developers to be creative enough to come up with exciting solutions. Because we're already it, giving them, this is what you need to design. Yes. And, and impeding creativity is a problem. And I'm not just a business analyst, I'm a human. And I go to websites all day long, sometimes when I'm supposed to be working. <laughs> and I have opinions about why Amazon is better than Borders.com, and I have opinion about why uh, Whoop.com is a cool model, and why 37 Signals has a really cool graphical interface. So I have an opinion about things I like. And I have to tell you that as a business analyst, I have a lot of power of inserting that stuff kind of into stories and trampling on the other people who should be designing that. Um, it's not that my opinion shouldn't be discussed, it's not that I shouldn't be allowed to share my opinion. It's not that I shouldn't be allowed to, to do anything with that. But I should sneakily put it in there and say, here's our solution, because I just happen to be the person with the pen and the paper, or the keyboard. Yeah. What I was taught a long time ago on this is what you're doing is you're, like you said, you're, you're decoupling it, but you're also coming at the essential actions, the essential events that you want free of any interface, just like you said. Yeah. So and the word that we were used was, you know, you know, we were doing it at a higher level at a, as a, as is to be, but you know, what is the essential behavior that you want to achieve? Okay. And independent independent of whatever implementation you and want. And essential behavior is we want to constantly refer back to that feature injection. We're hunting for the value. We're hunting for why someone imagine you don't work for a corporation but it's a startup. And every time you want to add a new screen You've got to go make a pitch for $13 million to develop it. You better have a good value statement. And large corporations, we forget about where that value is. And then we should be modeling what's especially important about that. And from that, saying, ooh, here's how we're going to get here fastest. Here's where we're going to add what's essential in those features. OK. We've covered the example, so I will skip this. So. It's a bunch of tiny stories using a particular grammatical structure. Language is important. As business analysts, it is our job to be masters of communication. I need to know that Jenny communicates better when I write in pictures, and Christy understands best when I talk to her, which is important because Richard only likes things written down. I need to know my audience as a business analyst. And the more you know your audience, the more you can get things accomplished. There are some businesses where if you don't do a SWOT analysis, they're not going to listen to anything else after that. It's just part of the culture. And there are some businesses where if you walk in with a SWOT analysis, they're going to kick you out and say, did you get an MBA over the weekend? Because we don't do that crap here. <laughs> you need to understand your audience. And sometimes that's an individual. Sometimes that's a company. But you need to understand how to communicate. And all of this is to enable us to do that. 
the point of this is to have the conversation, is to find misunderstandings, is to find where Jenny and Robin thought they understood something but didn't because we're having a conversation and we're finding the issues where there's a difference. And with that, we can now build something better. By focusing on generic and what's essential, we're drawing in conversations. We're pulling people in. This is the conversation. This is where the conversation is captured. I can never pronounce the same. Gajko Adzik. Okay, no one else seems to know either. Um, he's from Europe. He wrote this book, and he's a leader in the thinking of behind uh, behavior-driven development today. And he calls it specification by example. And he has a chart in this book that says that we've spent the last decade focusing on building things right. We want to build it right. Um, the problem is we're building it right, but because we're not focused on what the value is, we're not always building the right product. There's a really big difference between building the right product and building it right. As business analysts, we're so glad that we're invited to this table and we're so glad to be capturing things. Too often, we're busy capturing this and making sure that we build it right. But it's not the right product. Um, his chart goes on to say that um, <laughs> you can build it right and have a business failure. Sometimes you have useless crap. Who here has worked on a business failure or a useless crap product? Okay, I only saw about 60% of the hands, some of you are lying. Um, so we need to do both things. It's not enough to do one or the other. So let's cover what some of the benefits of doing this. And this is what software development practices need. We need assurance. We want to make sure that everyone understands the delivery. I'll stand out of the way. We want a common understanding. And when we have these stories that are fine-grained bits of behavior and good examples, we get it. Because if you have an example that doesn't fit, ooh, you found a new little scenario you need to write. That's important. Um, we need something precise so that we don't have problems where we have ambiguities. And that's, again, where the examples that amplify these scenarios come in. And we need to know when it's complete. Because too often in our projects, we're not sure of what's complete. We're not sure of when it's done. We're just sure that Sally stopped by my desk and asked her something else today. <laughs> and since not much was written down in the first place, OK, sure, we can add that. And at least she went to me, the VA, because usually she goes straight to the developers. Who benefits? Now, does anyone remember a movie um, with uh, Natalie Portman and Gary Oldman and John Rousseau called The Professional? Does anyone remember that movie? Not very many. So let me describe a little bit about the movie. Um, you've got this foreign guy who's a professional hitman. And he's taking care of this little girl in the building who was killed by a cop, a dirty cop, who's pretty much whacked out of his mind on crack. And this dirty cop has realized where the hitman lives and is going to retaliate. So the dirty cop comes in the building, and they storm in with their SWAT team. And the SWAT team of four to eight guys is promptly and without any issue killed, flat dead. <laughs> so you've got this dirty cop who's a little bit pissed off now. It wasn't bad enough he was on drugs and that his drug trade is being ruined, and that this hitman is taking care of him, but they just killed the whole SWAT team. It's a guy and a 10-year-old little girl. So he turns to his uh, buddy and says, bring me everybody. And his partner says, who? And Gary Oldman goes, everybody! <laughs> that whole story is because I think everybody. 
<laughs> Benefit from this. I play that whole scene for you right here because everybody can benefit from this. Okay, so seriously, who's it going to help? I argue it's going to help the business. I argue that the business is going to have a better understanding. I argue that the users are going to be happier, in part because we've unfaired the design, and in part because the architecture is built right, but in part because we're going to get out there faster because we were doing what was important. It's going to help testers because those little fine-grained stories with those great examples mean that we now have a great thing to test. Quite frankly, if you're using automation, you're using continuous delivery, wow, you can just leapfrog into this entry. Um, it's going to help developers because they have specific examples and they know what they're building towards. And I hope I've already shown you that it's going to help us because someone's going to finally read what I wrote. <laughs> it's so depressing when mom won't read my 200 page document. Uh, it's not about tools. Now, I haven't talked about tools all night, and now I have a slide that says it's not about tools. And why is that? Before I even read this, the people who are using BDD the most are not business analysts. It's developers. They're completely ignoring us, something we should own this damn domain, and they've ignored us. And they've gone straight to, this is really good. I wish my business analyst was doing this. I'm going to start working on my own. There's a whole suite of tools out there that help them use these stories or these scenarios to make things better. So Lisa Crispin wrote in her book, Agile Testing, these tools are intended for use by programmers to guide coding, but they can also be used to express business-facing tests that drive development, involving customers more closely in the process. So one of the experts in Agile Testing has said, while well, talking about tools, they're great, but they're not actually for the testing part. The, the important stuff happens before we can get there. So this is one of my pleas. Business analysts own this. Okay, there are some downsides here. And I want to be honest and tell you that not everything works the way you want. There are always downsides to things. This is one of them. So this may not help your philosophy. Velocity is how fast your team is working. Your velocity is um, how many points your team is getting, your scrum team. And I know a lot of IT managers who think that velocity is the end all be all of how productive my team is. And the teams work really hard to increase those points. Oh, I've got people laughing. So they live that. The, the truth is this may not help your velocity. It might help you build the right stuff but it may actually help you build up faster. I think that's a good trade-off. But if all you care about is how many points you got in the last two weeks, it might not help. Um, the other thing is that it's new. People don't know it. People don't understand it. Um, unless you're hitting the latest Twitter feed, uh, this might have missed you. Because there aren't many books on this topic. There's a couple chapters in a couple books on this topic. But it's not old school. It's too new for that. So your boss might not understand what you're talking about. Uh, question? So what do you think is new? I mean, I've, before I go in front of so what? So the, the concept of behavior-driven development, the concept of the story, the concept of the given win, what part of this is new? Um, well, recently, in, in some IT shops, anything we haven't done yesterday is new. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're really cool and great about anything that Apple produces. but or Google if you're in the Android camp. But we want to stick with what's tried and true, and tried and true is what my manager knows. And that's a common problem. Oh, so, so new is in terms of, of introducing it into the company. New. The other is that, um, well, uh, Dan North started this, oh, eight years ago, I think it was. I don't remember the date. Um, it's how new is eight years ago? Well. It's pretty new to a lot of people. I know some people say, wow, that's old school. That's, who cares? You know, that's before Ruby. That's ancient. But <laughs> there are many people who think that eight years ago, a concept was introduced, my gosh, you know, that's way too 
forward thinking for us. Please slow down. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the last thing is that tools, um, you know, just may cause clutter or slow things down. Um, you may not have to actually learn something new about how you do things. Wait, wait, that's kind of facetious. I want you guys to be learning all the time. So I don't really think that's a downside, but some people do. Did I cover all that? I cover all that. So here's a little recap about some of the things we've covered. Find the value. This is every software project is done, if you listen to Chris Metz, for one of three reasons. To make money, to save money, or to protect money. So find that value. Model the output. Understand what's important from that software system. Understand what's coming out of that software system and where it's adding value. So that from that model, you can put what's important first. Now remember, I told you to put what's important, that user story, that user statement. I said take it from one end and move it to the other. But it's not just in the story to put what's first. It's in the project to put what's first. Look for where the value is. Look for where you're going to be adding value. And have the team work on those things. And then communicate with scenarios. These fine grain bits of behavior, they're going to help us. And the last thing is build a bridge. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't talk about that. As a profession, we push requirements onto people. As a profession, profession, we talk to our customer and we gather up lots of understanding. We gather up all these statements. We gather up the system shall or a good user story. And then we act like a ferry boat. Do you know what a ferry boat does? A ferry boat takes all those requirements or all those cars and it puts it on the ferry boat. And then I have to take it, business analyst, ferry boat, whatever, to my development team. Let's get a couple more. Okay. You ready? Toot toot. <laughs> ferry boats take a long time. Hold on. Hey, Dev Team, I have a whole bunch of requirements for you. What's that? You've got questions? Oh, hold on. Load them on the ferry boat. <laughs> do I have all your questions? I do? Good. Toot toot. <laughs> Sometimes when you're a ferry boat, there's a speedboat running by. Or someone's on vacation and you can't do anything, so you just sit there and then walk. <laughs> toot toot. <laughs> I unload my questions. Do you know what they give me? Answers. They give me answers. <laughs> Where do the answers go? Okay, on the back of the ferry boat. I'm not getting paid enough as a captain. <laughs> toot toot! And I go back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth! As a business analyst, I'm pushing questions and I'm pushing requirements. Oh my god, it's exhausting. I don't want to be a ferry boat anymore. What I want to do is I want to reach out my hand to my customers. And I want to reach out my hand to my development team. And I want to use a common language. I want to be a bridge where the cars just go back and forth night and day. And I facilitate a conversation. 
and I capture the conversation, and I build a common understanding, and as a bridge, I'm making a really big difference. As a bridge, we can build the right product. Thank you very much. Question. I like that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that uh, bridge you're talking about, is that like a JAD session in joint application development session? Um, well, a JAD session, by definition, is actually a very formal methodology that lots of people say they've done them, and very few have. And no, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I don't mind a JAD session or a project start or an initiation phase or a quick start or pick any of 20 names. What I really want is an ongoing conversation back and forth, that as a business analyst, I'm helping the, the customers you know, explain what they want and need to the developers. And I'm helping the developers understand this business language, the domain that they're speaking about, so we can go back and forth and have a common conversation about these fine-grained bits of behavior and these examples that I know are making a difference with everyone. So it's not one session, it's a regular conversation, though I will have some of those big meetings. A question about I'm just curious, like, is there any success stories, like some companies they utilize the 3D or um, any projects that really There work? are success stories. I've worked at a couple places. I don't think I'm allowed to say their names. Um, a major airline here in town? There's two. You can pick one. Um, <laughs> we're going to their deck in a couple months for a social event. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are some success stories out there. Um, there aren't as many as I want, and there are certainly not very many where the business analyst has gotten the whole team involved because the developers <coughs> are finding these tools that help them, and they're bringing in the back door, and sometimes the, the business analysts don't even know what the heck's going on, which is a shame. So Question over here, then we'll leave this way. So you're really saying that you want to be a conduit, not a translator? Yes, yes. And, that's, and I used to say I was a translator. So I translated, my translation always sounded like the system shall, which really isn't a very good translation. But I was proud of it. So, question over here. Um, yeah, sticking with that conduit analysis, actually, because um, I think it's relevant here. It feels like the core of this, um, the value, it is the value in the user story, right? I mean, that's what you yes. said. The value should be expressed first. Um, what I've found in this scenario um, is that a dev's concept of value and a business concept of value are uh, two different magnitudes oftentimes. So being just a simple conduit isn't always functional, right? Because then the devs get overloaded with what the business concept of value is versus what they perceive value. So how do you mediate that discussion as a bridge or a conduit? So you're saying how do I mediate the conversation between all the parties? But I think what you're trying to say is how do I throttle it so I don't overwhelm anybody? Well, yeah. <laughs> Or, or how do you uh, negotiate? How do you yeah, no, okay. mediate? Okay. Right, right. Um, I think that part of that is done in that when I'm speaking to my development team over here, that I'm worried about the work that they're doing now and they're preparing to start. You know, unless I'm in an early architecture phase where I'm trying to understand the big picture, and that usually has a small amount of time compared to the entire project. What I'm worried about is. Do you understand this story here? Do you understand what we're about to build? We're writing this value, you know, and do you understand what you're about to start? I don't want to give them everything. So in that way as a bridge, I guess I do have a tiny toll that says that conversation we can hold, and I put it in my backbone. Uh, well, I asked you, we'll go yeah. ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, how do QA folks receive this uh, given when then stuff? My experience is that QA folks love this given when then stuff. Um, presuming that they're getting some of those tools, they may be able to even automate some of their tests. But even without the automation capabilities, a QA person should be able to say that I have um, this example of behavior. It's, it's described very well. Given this, when I do that, I see this result. It's very easy for them to test that and I may have been given them examples that they can plug into that so that it should escalate their speed. Um, it's important to say that in this conversation um, that the BA should not be the only person writing these scenarios. Remember, there's one point in one slide that said 
This is the conversation capture. You should be doing this as a conversation with people. You should do this conversation with the business and with the team. And the team is not just developers, the team includes those testers. So one comment and one question. My comment is, is that in terms of this conversation that, that you have with people, the project that I've been on for quite a while, that's what we've evolved into. And every day, I mean, at the beginning of a cycle, we get the business people and the developers and the testers and any downstream folks together either by phone or by person and we go over in fairly detail that's what I did all last week and they can ask all the questions they want and again it sets up the environment so that they continue to ask questions and when they have more questions we have we can have a standing meeting we have a, every day we have a time frame that they can raise more questions and we get the business people on those phone calls and we constantly do that it's kind of like continuous integration so that's my comment. My question is, is, okay, so you talk about stories and scenarios and fine grain. So how fine grain are these things? And how much detail do you put into those fine grains? Um, in general, I want one result. So I want one tiny bit of behavior in my then part, given one then. When I get to the then, I want one little thing. So for any given user story, I may have four or 14 of these little scenarios that describe the little tiny bits of behavior. Because I only really want one thing to come out of that acceptance criteria out of that scenario. So you've got a lot of little boxes. Yes, a lot of little boxes. Because that gives the developer something very fine grained ask. Hold on just a second. So, uh, and you may have answered part of this in, in, in your answer just now, but in the, so in the scope of, of the traditional agile kind of story card that has a story and a set of acceptance criteria, does this supersede any of that or does this augment that? Um, um, I would say that all the existing acceptance criteria that people are writing should stop and never be written again. <laughs> Ever! <laughs> because um, they just don't work as well, and they're not consistent, and they're not as helpful as doing it this way. Um, and part of what I said that teams should work together is that you should have a common understanding of how to write these stories and how fine grain this is. Um, if you're ending up with 40 or 50 of these little scenarios for your user story, the user story is probably too big. Um, I'm sure it is. But the, um, if you're only getting one, I'm gonna question What's, where's the value in that user story since it's, you can capture it so, such a small amount of work? So th there is a judgment there, but the team needs to work together to also write them consistently. So. So, and, uh, so there's a level of complexity that reaches non-comprehension at a certain number, you say 20. Probably less than 20. Well, right, if you remember the slide, I said that you know, VAs grapple with difficult yeah. things because things are complex. Um, I want to break down my stories to a size where they're very understandable so that one developer, one developer pair can pick them up and comprehend it without having come back to me too often. If they do, that's okay. But I don't want them to be forced to because I put too much complexity in that. Too few is too big. Too, too few might be, might very well too big. Yes. And that's my statement. So I think we have time for one more question. So my question is, uh, during all the collaboration of the team, we've got information architects, architects, UX designers, coders, testers. When decisions are made about what is going to occur, how they're going to code it, and the results, who do you think should be, or what's your take on how that should be documented, either by the team, the BA, how should that be? So that everybody knows the end result. I think that um, I don't care who documents in yeah. some ways. And I'm welcome to take lots of documentation. I think that there are certainly things that should be owned by different people. In general, the BA should be the master of communication. Mm -hmm. So they should own all the communication. But it doesn't make sense for me, the BA, to write what the information our architect is doing. And I think we need coding standards that says, in general, we're going to solve these problems with these approaches or patterns. A dev should be writing those and communicating those. So there's all kinds of levels. I guess the question is what they're. But in general, the BA should understand what's going on and should own it yeah, and make I sure it's happening. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot, 
remember part of this is capturing the conversation. Part of this is helping remember the conversation. So I don't need to do a scenario for every negative thing that can happen. And I don't probably need a scenario that says, you know, given a nuclear bomb has gone off when I try to log it. Really? Who's cared about your stupid application after that? So <laughs> I've seen those requirements. Mm -hmm. I don't want, but don't go there. Mm -hmm. It's part of the problem. Um, I, I now want to end the conversation on this one. I will be around later. And Gina is somewhere. She's going to take over the last few slides um, as we close up the meeting. Thank you, everyone, very much.